Welcome to Friendship Vallejo. I'm Pastor Justin, and this is the place where everybody's welcome, nobody's perfect, and anything is possible. Amen. I'll be reading from the English Standard Version of the Word of God. Hear ye the Word of the Lord. So Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had, and Lot with him into the Negev. Now Abram was very rich in livestock and silver and in gold, and he journeyed on from the Negev as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai. Verse 4, to the place where he had made an altar at the first. And there Abram called upon the name of the Lord. And Lot, who went with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents so that the land could not support both of them dwelling together for their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together and there was strife there between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock and at that time the Canaanites and the Parasites were dwelling in the land then Abram said to Lot let there be no strife between you and me and between your herdsmen and my herdsmen, for we are kinsmen, we kinfolk, we family. It's not the whole land before you, so separate yourself from me. If you take the left hand, then I will go to the right, or if you take the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and saw that the Jordan Valley was well watered everywhere like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt in the direction of Zoar. This was before, however, the Lord had destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself all the Jordan Valley and Lot journeyed east. Thus they separated from each other. And Abram settled in the land of Canaan while Lot settled among the cities of the valley and moved his tent as far as Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against the Lord. Yet the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward, for all the land that you see I will give to you and to your offspring forever. I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth, so that if one can count the dust of the earth, your offspring also can be counted. Arise, walk through the length and the breadth of the land, for I will give it to you. And so Abram moved his tent and came and settled by the oaks of Mamre, which are at Hebron. And there he built an altar to the Lord. The word of God for the people of God. And the people say it. On your way down to your seat, remind yourself the preacher's going to preach about, I've got a lot to lose. I've got a lot to lose. Thank you to our music ministry and our first impressions. In just about 70 days, there is a special day that uh, is going to occur. It occurs every year. Um, I don't know about you, but the Lord, around this time, the Lord begins to speak to me concerning the next year of my life. And for most people, their new year begins on January one. But not I. There's this day that the Lord has specifically set aside for me to remember and recall what he's done, but to also position myself for what is ahead. October 9th, such a pivotal day, such a special day, a wonderful day. October 9th is special not only to myself, but I think it should be special to those I'm in relationship with. I think everybody should know about the day, October. Hey Amen, you're a good class this morning. The beauty and the significance 
of October 9th is not just that it's my birthday, <laughs> but it also marks the beginning of a new year for God to do and dwell in my life. Around this time, I am pensive. I ponder, what is it that I've accomplished? What is it that I've done? What is it that I have not done that the Lord has given me to do? What is it that was on my heart that I positioned myself to achieve? And where are those gaps? Where are those lapses? Where are those spaces for growth that I still have to journey through? You should try this every year when it comes to your birthday. You should be looking back to see how far you can go. And in that, I partner with the Lord. I enter into a time of further consecration. I begin to separate myself from things that cloud my thinking, things and habits and patterns that are necessarily are, are not bad, but I can't think, I can't hear clearly. Got to make space for the Lord to speak to me. So I turn off the TV and I turn off going to certain spaces and I put down certain things to clean myself and clear myself. You know something that's interesting? The more that I look back over my young life, I find that it is marked by two things. One, I find and observe that there are two constants in my life. The first are the choices and decisions that I make. And when I look back over the record of my life, it is unusually marked by separations, transitions, and exits. Choices, decisions, in separation. Sometimes they appear separately and other times they come as a result of the other. I'm reminded of this quote that used to be said to me often, you may be born looking like your parents, but you'll die looking like the choices and decisions you've made. Interesting. The choices that you and I make that position and pivot our lives in ways that benefit us and others. And sometimes it takes us down detours and lanes of distress and despair. Choices, we all have them. Choices, we all have to make them. The choices and decisions we make are very critical to realizing God's idea for our lives. And what are choices? What are decisions? For those of us who seem and appear that our lives are full of powerlessness, for those of you all who may be hopeless, for those of you all who may be struggling, let me give you your power back. Choices and decisions are invitations to power. that you have more control over your life than you give yourself credit for. We may not be able to decide the circumstances and the categories and the situations that happen to us. I told us two weeks ago, but we have a constant responsibility to respond to it. While many of us are learning how to react God wants us to better respond to those things. Invitations to power, choices, decisions spiritually. Who is going to lead you? What deity have you decided will be the God of your life? Choices in your relationships, or whether they are familiar, whether they are platonic or romantic, we all have choices with our careers and in our educational pursuits, choices. Some of us have, don't even know the depths of the responsibilities that comes with being you, with parenting and husbanding and wifing and 
high, having hiring and firing power, with leading and shepherding, with making life and death decisions. Somebody say choices. We all have them. What are those choices? What are those decisions? I told you, they are invitations to exercise power. You, wanna, you want power? Make a decision. Do you want power? Don't make a decision. Because you think you're not making a decision or you're delaying that decision is not making a decision. However, you just made a decision. And no matter, I don't know why I'm going here, no matter what you're trying to delay, I tell people all the time that whenever God calls somebody, he doesn't just call people to preach. This microphone in 30 minutes on a Sunday is not reserved for everybody. Amen? But all of us have a call from God of how he wants to represent himself through us. Amen? But there are those of us who are weary against God's call because you are wondering, what will I have to give up and sacrifice for it? Will I have a life? Will people accept me? And so we delay and deny God as if he won't stop calling. Well, spoiler alert, God will continue to call and cause you until he gets a holy yes from you. And the reality is, everything that he calls you to is bigger than yourself. It is more than what you can imagine. That's why it'll take him to do it. And so if you are in the midst of a delay or denial, if you are in the conundrum in the middle place with God, and he's asking you to do something, might I invite you to say yes? Why? Because you're more safe in a yes than in an unholy no. Because when you say no to the Lord, he has to turn you over to who and what you choose to worship instead. And he will allow life to draw you back to the beginning place. You talking about wasting your time. Keep saying no to the Lord. You talking about all hell breaking loose. Say no to the Lord. Because you're safe in this yes. What you and I choose and decide is called power. And that type of power has taught me that it requires a certain level of trust and dependency, not on other folk. Because folk can be phony, they can be picky, they can be messy, they can be up one day and not talking to you the next. People are just fickle. Not everybody, but every now and then you just face people, you're like, Lord, why I got to deal with them? And he's saying, now I've put in them some answers for you, but I don't need your dependency to be on them. I need your trust and dependency to remain in me. I've got the answer. I've got the supply. But you got to do it with them. What do you do when God makes you mess with dirty stuff? Talk about playing in dirt. Messy stuff. If I were to be honest, if I were to confess, Maybe up until maybe three years ago, around the pandemic, I used to have trust issues. My name is Brandon Jadarius Smithson, and I used to. <laughs> have trust issues. But because I realized that the life that has been assigned in the lot that has been assigned to my life is unusual. It's not predictable. If I'm going to live this life, I got to trust God. If you're going to live your life, you've got to trust God, even when it's not easy, with your questions, with your fears, with your responses to what life is doing, somebody look at somebody and tell them, God can handle it. He, he, he can handle it all. Because you can't. 
in our camp. That was until I accepted the fact that sometimes separations in my life, in your life, are necessary. I used to struggle with that till I realized that I, I struggled with abandonment. That was the root of it. And so when people died and moved, and when people exited my life, it was a stronghold. It was straining on me. It made me look at myself as what is wrong with you that people keep leaving your life. Or people who are supposed to stand instead leaving the part. What is wrong with me? Well, let me answer it. Nothing. I'm talking to the eight-year-old version of you where that person was supposed to come back and they did not. And you've been asking yourself since then, what is wrong with me? Now, the truth be told, there are some things that, you know, God got to... But contextually, when it comes to this, look at me. It is not your fault. Mama, daddy teacher, whoever. It is not your fault. So what do we do with that? Exits, transitions, and separations. What I've learned that they are all a part of the teaching tools of God to advance our lives. Sometimes separations, transition, and exits are temporary and you'll find yourself reconciling and being restored and reconnecting to people and situations and churches and organizations that you've had history with only because it be, it's beneficial to that season of your life. Then there are other separations, y'all, that occur because it does not benefit you. Not necessarily for you to, to receive something, but it does not take you into the measure of a person that you are supposed to be to the world. And so God will cause people to, well, not cause, but sanction folk to fall out on you. Folk that you thought was forever. They even share your DNA. Preach to yourself, Brandon. Where you like, they'll always be there. And then God will tap you on the shoulder, wake you up from your sleep. And when you, if you're hard-headed like me, you'll still sleep anyway, go in your dreams. And say, hey, son, hey, daughter, I'm about to ask you something. It is, might feel hard, but I got you. Mm, don't cry. Every exit or separation are always permanent forever. Some of them are temporary for a specific season of your life and development, but then there are others that are necessary for our lives, our development, and for our purpose. And there are certain things, certain people, certain environments, certain patterns, certain ways of thinking, certain ways of behaving, certain passions that eventually you and I have to say goodbye to. Somebody say goodbye. These are holy goodbyes. You say bye-bye to your pains, bye-bye to your sorrows, bye-bye to their toxic relationship, bye-bye to living beneath your purpose and potential, bye-bye to stinking thinking, bye-bye to remaining the same, goodbye to those traditions and policies and things that we do that have no merit, goodbye to the old way of life that keeps me stagnant and doesn't make me grow and that keeps me from loving folk, bye-bye. Loving, bye-bye. Like it, bye-bye. Hate it, bye-bye. All of us <laughs> have to have some goodbyes. I told you before that some bye-byes are really see you later. Where God will cause reconnection and reconciliation to, to take place because it's vital to where he's taking you. But then there are others that he wants you to be completely rid of. Life is full of choices and decisions, separations and exits. So what do we do with them? Let's go to Bible study real quick. 
I love how scripture can often mirror reality in the 21st century. About three or four years ago, around this time that I started uh, to get over my trust issues, I began studying the life and profiles of individuals in the scriptures whom God asked to do crazy things without giving them all the answers. One of those individuals was Abram. Studied his life from Genesis chapter 12 through Genesis chapter 25. He he has an interesting life. Someone of an ordinary person who God chooses to do extraordinary things. For me, devotionally, I've been following the narrative of Abram because God has been addressing my ability to trust him in ways that I've never trusted him before. And I think there's someone in here like me. Lord, I trust you with this, but ain't nobody touching that. (laughs) You can have all of this, But that, don't talk about it, don't touch it, don't bring it up. And he says, you've got to be vulnerable enough to allow me to confront the dirty spaces and truths about yourself because I'm the one that know you for real. I'm the one that can rewrite your script. I'm the one who at the end of the day, if you will allow, can change your life. And so God is calling us and causing us to address, highlight, and spotlight that which we refuse to trust them with. And the real- realization is that our little becomes much and our nothing becomes something when we put it in the right hands because it's a part of God's development process. God is not interested in fulfilling promise just so that we can be cool and good with him. God's interest in our lives is in our development. I told you a couple weeks ago that before we were born a person, before life hit us and touched us, we were born a purpose. And that before life happened, God had an intention that sin and culture has polluted. And so when we reconnect with God, he has to reorient us to our original selves beyond what parents and families and culture and teachers and friends and what you want and what the devil wants. He says, I have an original, a divine design for your life that I have to prepare you for, that I have to give you language and tools for because other people and other things have informed you of who you are and it's not your true self. And so in Genesis, the book of beginnings, as we enter the end of this seventh month and into the eighth month of this year, it's crazy that August is already here. The month of new beginnings. It is the month where we begin again. Right around chapter 12, we are introduced to the narrative of Abram. He's called to go to a place he has never known to follow a God that he just met. It is here where God reveals for the first of three times his plan to make a nation out of him. To bless his seed and through that seed, all nations of the world would be blessed. And we've learned that that blessing of Abraham, his name is Jesus. God's answer to reconciling humanity back into himself. And God also mentions giving Abraham some territory to expand his reach and influence, not so that he can hoard his social status and parade it as if he's bigger and better, but God expands his territory so that he can learn how to be responsible for more than just himself. And at each stage of Abram's journey, people of God, he carries with him his wife, Sarai, at this point, his livestock, his herdsmen, and his family, including his nephew, Lot. And at each place he dwells, as this traveling nomad, he decides to build an altar unto the Lord. And when we get to chapter 14, 13, suddenly a famine arises, 
and all he has and all he owns journeys to Egypt. You know, you got some people that lie real well. Once he goes to this place, he's trying to provide and get some things for his family. And so he decides to set his wife up. You'll see that Abram's got it, in too, got, got it in him too to lie, to get what he wants. He tells his wife to lie to the Pharaoh so that he wouldn't be killed because she was a baddie. She was fine. My granddad would say she's a brick house. That it appears she was worth killing for. And when they arrived, shown sure up. Sarai's beauty captures the attention from everyone in the palace, including Pharaoh. And for, for her, he lavishes Abram with gifts of riches and wealth. Eventually, Pharaoh discovers the truth of who she is due to a series of plagues that the Lord orchestrated. And so they are excommunicated from Egypt, including all the riches that they were given to him. And Abram journeys back to the places that he first met God to worship, pray, and inquire or ask of him where they go next. You see, throughout your journey, you'll be presented with opportunities to lie to get ahead. But you will only gain trouble. You and I have to believe that the provision we need for where we're going, God has already provided. I don't know who it's coming from, when it's coming to you, and by which way. But God has already stabbed your life and my life for wherever it is that we're going. And now in Genesis 13, we discover Abram, his livestock, his herdsmen, his family, and his nephew Lot. And, them. and they grew so much so that they could no longer be held in the space that they were in due to infighting in the camp. Ain't it funny that some of the things that people fight for, they can't, they don't really have a real claim to? Imagine fussing, fighting, arguing about something that you're attached to, but does not belong to you. Somebody say, oh Lord. Your child was gifted to you, but they belong to the Lord. This church was founded by some strong families, but this ain't your church. This is the Lord's church. Your destiny, your purpose. I know America tells us, go after it, whatever you want. But your purpose don't even belong to you or me. It belongs to the Lord. And so at this friction, at this tension, after this stuff arises, Abram is off praying, and upon realizing what's taking place, he looks over to his nephew, who he loves, Lot, and says, let there be no strife. He draws a line in the sand and said, I am tired of arguing. I am tired of putting on. I am tired of dealing with this. In other words, I don't want no smoke. There's no reason to have these problems between my people and your people because we are all family. We are better than that. We ain't got to fight over this stuff. In fact, look around. All of this belongs to the Lord. In fact, let me help you out. If you choose the left side, I'll take the right. If you choose the right, I'll go to the left. What God has given is big enough for both of us. We just can't dwell in the same space right now. So Lot lifts his eyes and begins to survey the east side of the land. And without any special consideration or consulting, he looks down into the Jordan Valley and selects this seemingly plush land that he deems will most benefit he and his. And it looks to have all that the, he would want and everything he thinks he needs. But the Bible warns us at least three times that what lies beneath, what he sees, will cause him to lose more than he leaves. 
It is not until after Abram and Lot have separated that we discover that that is when the Lord begins to speak. And he says to him, now Abram, you lift up your eyes, hallelujah, and see all that is before you, beginning from where you're standing onward, from the north, the south, the east, and the west, including the space you gave away to your nephew. That also belongs to you. In fact, I'll bless your seed and increase you to the point that it can't be measured. And he commands him to observe and survey all that God has destined him to have. And Abram responds to God by moving his dwelling place and there builds another altar unto God to celebrate what God has done. That's the story. And I believe it offers something that you and I should take note of as we journey through the life of Abram. Abram's life, among other things, teaches us about the significance gained from forsaking the familiar in order to seize the future. That on the other side of divine endings, exits, separations, and transitions are the next steps you need to journey closer to the future that God has for you and I. So, let me provide you some principles. I'll pray, and then we'll go home. Some of us. <laughs> some of us got to work. What are some things that you need to know in handling divine separations? Number one, in the first seven verses of chapter 13, we see what God is trying to develop in Abram and in you and I. And that is how to cultivate a life worth living. That if you and I are going to be somebody, if you and I are going to go somewhere, what are you waking up to pay attention to? No, I'm full of songs. God wants us to cultivate a, a life worth living. What does that mean? Number one, you have to have a selfless life. The Bible says, so Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and Lot with them into the Negev. Now Abram was very rich in livestock, in silver, and in gold. You and I have to understand that your life is not your own. That God designed and created us to live a life that is not separate from one another. That in you are the advancement, solutions, and answers to problems that the world is asking and to those that have yet to appear. You have substance, no matter if it's big or it's small. You and I have giftings and skill sets and talents and influence, not to hoard, but because we're an answer. And so God has called you and I to live a selfless life, but number two, He's also called us to live a spiritual life, a spiritually guarded life. And he journeyed on from the Negev as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai to the place where he had made an altar to the Lord. And there Abram called upon the name of the Lord. What Abram is teaching us is that you and I must build altars to track I passed with God while also creating new history with God. It speaks to our worship life. I'm not just talking about a slow song in a tear. That's not worship. I'm not just talking about lifted hands in a humble heart. That's not just worship. Worship is a posture of life. It is the, knowing the reality that I do not belong to myself and that because I have a choice, I've decided to yield myself to the one who has all power in his hand, to the one who knows my beginning from my end, and to the one who can staff me with what I need to live this life. And so my fidelity, my commitment, my desires are all submitted unto him so that others can see him. He reveal, God reveals purpose in stages. 
most of my ministry life have always been asked, how do I determine my purpose? How do I find my purpose? Well, I've discovered that God reveals purpose in stages. And prayer becomes the tool you and I use to communicate to God. But worship is how you and I posture our lives to receive revelation. You want answers? Worship him. It's not just when we're giving and not just when we gather in here for 90 minutes. Worship is when you're on your way to your job and on your way to pick up your family and you just recognize, God, you are with me. God, you are for me. God, you have the answers. God, I need you to lead me. Worship is knowing that you have limitations. And just because you have limitations does not make you weak. Just because you have limitations does not make you small. What it says is, I need an invitation for a source to come in and make up the difference. And some of us go to bodies, some of us go to bottles, some of us go to the bank to get it. But God is saying, I'm all you need. Come to me. Cry unto me. I give you what you need. You want to cultivate a life worth living, you have to, you and I have to be, live a selfless life. We have to be generous of ourselves, our resources, our skills. We have to be spiritually grounded, but then thirdly, we have to learn how to handle stress and strife. Because stress and strife are a part of life. And Lot, verse 5, who went with Abram and also had flocks and herds and tents so that the land could not support both of them dwelling together for their possessions were so great that they couldn't dwell together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram and Lot's herdsmen. And at that time, the Canaanites and Parasites were dwelling in the land. How do you interpret when trouble comes in your life? Do you immediately go to what you did do or what you didn't do? Do you automatically take a a, a responsibility? Or have you ever considered that you don't have to do nothing wrong in your life for stress, strife, tension, pain, problems, testing, trials, or tribulations to hit your life? You could be minding your own business and bam, here comes something. Here comes strife. Here comes stress. Here comes a misunderstanding. Here comes someone's opinion. Here comes someone's preference. Here comes an email change. Here comes DMs. Here comes side conversations. Here comes plots. Here comes threats. But sometimes, people of God, trouble is not an indicator that you're doing something wrong. Sometimes, Trouble is an indication that something's right about you. It could be that God is trying to notify you that you yourself have grown and don't notice it. You didn't know that you could go through what you go through, do what you could do, until you endured whatever that was. How many of you all have noticed over the last couple of months or so some things from the past have started to show up back in your life? Well, let me give you a spoiler alert. When the past comes, it's a sign that the future is near. It's not always an invitation for you to go back, but God is trying to notify you, hey, you've grown, you've grown, but you don't notice it. And so I will allow the same test to come while Satan is trying to tempt you God is going to test you to show you you're over that. To show you you're stronger than that. To show you you're bigger than that. And so what is it that we have to recognize? We got to cultivate a a life worth living that is a selfless life. That is a spiritual life. That is a life that is able to handle stress and strife. Why? Why? Because you're going to be willing to lose your lot. Verses 8 through 13. What is your lot? Let's define this and I'm on an uh, expressway. Your lot, my lot, are those people, places, or loyalties that you and I love 
have history with, and even support. But when it comes to making destiny decisions, these lots become selfish, double-minded, and often choose the easy way out. Your lots, my lots, are those people, places, and things that are barriers to you obeying God. They are an attitude. They may be relationships. They may be people. And if you don't separate yourself from them, you risk losing a lot more than you had to give in the first place. So losing your lot is not necessarily about the quantity of your decisions, but about the quality of how God wants to redistribute or reconfigure your value to a people, place, or thing. What do you need to know about separation? Number one, separation does not have to be hostile. <laughs> you don't have to cuss folk out. Hold on, scratch it. We don't have to cuss folk out. We don't have to go off. We don't have to make videos. We don't have to make websites and blogs. We don't have to blast their business or their secrets. When you and I separate, it ain't got to get messy. Because if it does, what it does tell me, what it exposes, is your level of maturity spiritually. When people separate and they get crazy, they make subtle threats and, and send email chains and are plotting and all of that type of stuff, you know what that says? They don't have the fruit of the Spirit. They're not Christ-like. Right? But then socially, what it, emotionally what it tells me is that you are emotionally immature and you don't have good conflict resolution skills, which says that you need several things, like I did. You need Jesus, a therapist, some good friends, and some of us need Proverbs 18, 23. It says, a mouth of a fool invites a beating. Y'all ever wanted to whoop on somebody who came to you sideways? I think that's what the reason that some of us are in the positions that we are. You ain't been whooped in a long time. You ain't been popped in a long time. I mean, smack the stew out of them. But thank God for Jesus. Woo! Thank God for Jesus who helps me to restrain myself. I ain't got to add to a record. I ain't got to deal with no consequences because I done unalive you. Ooh. Be but because of what you have done against me and what has been done against you. They talk so reckless and so wet you just like, I will smack you right here. But Jesus says, you don't have to. I have something for that. But Lord, I need vindication. I got something for that. Yield yourself to me. Yield yourself to me. Am I saying be a punk? You know you're not one. Am I saying be silent? Sometimes God will tell you shut up. I'm saying there is a way to fight the wars in your life. And what happens is when you and I take matters in our own hands, we relinquish God from intervening. And not only will he not deal with them, now he has to deal with you. So some of y'all wondering why haven't things changed? You got in the way. And so God is pulling on your character. I'll be honest with you. About a couple months ago, I was going through something, and some things were happening where I found myself getting a little loose. Had to pull my own, hey, hey, I didn't know I was such a ninja. I thought that man died some years ago, but it just rose like, whoa. And I was asking the Lord before I was about to quit this pro the process that I was in, I said, Lord, why is this happening? Are you testing me? I mean, it was coming from left and right, from the front to the back, from family and friends to strangers to folk. And he said, Brandon, 
You've mastered patience. You've got meekness. You even have self-control. But what I want to put in you is called long-suffering. It is the ability to endure outward tension and still be in control. Not on my own power. Because I told you what I want to do. But the Lord is saying, I need more of you in you because some things you're going to have to lead them to. The things that you're going to have to display in front of them. There are some things you're going to say that they ain't going to have an idea from, but they're going to watch your life. They're going to have a front row seat, hallelujah, to your transformation. And he said, don't be hostile. Listen to me and obey. Second thing he says, separation doesn't have to be hostile, but separation is also a choice. It's not the whole land before you. Separate yourself from me. If you take the left hand, I'll take the right. If you take the right, I'll take the left. Which provides us with decision-making power, and it presents another option for us to dwell amongst one another without the tension. You go over there, and I'll be over here. He said it's a choice that I don't have to sit you down. You can sit your own self down. That if you're not Christ-like, if your attitude is not friendly, if you have not submitted to the mission and vision of this church, you do not qualify to serve in the ministry. That you can check yourself and say, Lord, me and you need some time. And until we get this together, I'm going to move out the way. My servant leader don't got to say nothing. Pastor Brandon don't got to say nothing. I can sit my own self down. Or maybe it's in your relationships. Lord, I ain't talked to my husband or my wife. I haven't told them the truth about what's going on with me. It don't got to be violent. It don't got to be hostile. And I ain't got to cuss you and call you out of your name. Even if I'm justified, even if I'm emotional and angry, I'm not saying don't be emotional. I'm saying don't be led by them. Because there are decisions that you'll have to make and life that you'll have to do with those very people. Some of those people who are antagonizing you are just hurt. They need healing. And this is the thing. If they open themselves up, God will do it. I'm telling you what I know. And then there are select few who are demonically influenced. And Jesus calls us to cast them out. That doesn't mean kick them out unless you need it, Matthew 18. It's saying to cast the devil out of you. And I'm going to teach you about that. What, what does that mean? Because some of us are being led by demonic influences. You're not being led by Christ. You're led by the devil who is selfish and manipulative, who hoards power, who tries to intimidate. Those are signs you are not led by the Lord. And for anybody in here, that's a sign you don't need to be in leadership. So let this be your invitation and warning. Who's leading you? And as pastors, it is our job to protect and preserve the sheep because God is maturing all of us. Somebody say all of us. And that requires intentionality. It's a choice. But also, the point of separation is to make room for future progress. I told you what's not going to go on in here, but there's some things that shouldn't go on at your house. There are certain things you cannot no longer allow from toxic individuals. If they can't speak to you instead of at you, we can't have communication. Somebody need to exercise the block button. Some of us need to exercise cutting off their address. Some of us need to say no. But why? It is possible to be gaining while you feel like you're losing because only God can add to your life while something's being subtracted. 
The reason why God allows separation in our lives is to make room for what's coming. Who's coming? Including who you're supposed to be. Then, separation, you got to be careful when you separate because just because you separate does not mean you won't be seduced. Separation sometimes seduces. And Lot lifted up his eyes and saw that the Jordan Valley was well watered and everywhere like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt in the direction of Zoar. So Lot chose for himself all of that. And just because you have the right to choose does not exempt you from losing. If you're not careful with your motives when you separate, if you're not intentional about God healing you when you separate, separation may be I'm going to sit down for a minute. Separation may be I'm going to shut my mouth. Separation may be I'm at another location. Whatever separation means for you, you have to be willing to lose your lot. Why? Lastly, and I'm done, because you never lose when you're led by the Lord. Verses 14 through 18. Notice what is gained. The Lord said to Abram, after Lot has separated from you, after, after you separated from your Lot, then God starts talking. After you've done what he asked you to do, that is when the clarity comes. Not before, but after you obey. He says two things. Let me cut through the field. I'll bring you into ownership and I'll expand your influence. Watch the scripture. After a lot of separated from him, the Lord said to Abram, lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward, for all the land that you see, I will give to you and your offspring forever. I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth so that if one can count the dust of the earth, your offspring also can be counted. Arise! Walk through the length and the breadth of the land, for I'll give it to you. I'll bring you into a space of responsibility of which you did not have before, but I'll increase your influence because I can use your name for me. Notice what is gained, but finally, notice what is given. Verse 18. So Abram moved his tent and came and set up by the oaks of Mamre, which are at Hebron. And there he built an altar to the Lord. Abram, just like I did coming here, obeyed God and he worshiped. Why does that boy kneel at the altar? Why does he lift his hand? Why? Does he clap? Because if I don't, I'm going to cuss you out. If I don't, I'm going to be full of myself. If I don't, I'm going to become who hurt me. If I don't, I'm going to abuse you when I'm designed to help you. If I don't, I'm going to be out of pocket. If I don't, I'm going to be in jail. If I don't, somebody going to kill me. If I don't, I said I, because I can put my stuff out there. But if we don't, we will suffer losses that God didn't intend for us to have in the first place. God introduces separations as safeguards so that he can usher us into places we've never seen. And at each stage of our journey, God wants us to pause, obey, and then worship him. It's in it's God extending an invitation, you say yes or no, that initiates a process for God to prepare your life for how you should live in it, or manage what he showed or told you, or brings you to make some decisions that may include separations, but he only separates to lead you and I. Remember, you never lose when you're with the Lord, when you're led by the Lord, and you never lose when you learn from your life. Father, in the name of Jesus, you have interrupted our regularly scheduled lives and programs because you wanted to give definition to some transitions that are taking place, that have happened and are about to happen, that you sanctioned holy and divine separations 
only because you're developing us. Some of them are for forever. Some of them are just temporary until we get to a space where we are benefiting from your direction. Thank you, God, for the opportunity to follow you again. You are the God that makes all things new. And we deliberately decide that we will follow you forward. Now, Father, I pray for the life who is struggling with their obedience. They're afraid of being hurt, let down, taken advantage of. They're afraid of life happening the way that it did before. I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, that you would touch their heart right now. Thank you for using me as your sign and your echo, that they are most safe in the yes of the Lord than in the no of the Lord. That if they're going to run, run into you. If they're going to fear, fall into you. For you are the God that moves us forward. Lord, I pray for every broken and fractured heart, whether it's from their parents or from leaders or even word curses spoken from strangers and themselves. Father, heal. Lift your hands. Father, heal this heart. Lift your hands. Lift your hands. Lift your hands. Don't be resistant. Don't be prideful. Lord, heal this heart. We surrender to you, God, those spaces in us that have been disobedient, resistant, rebellious to your way. Help us, Lord, to become more like you, even in the midst of divine separations. We love you, we honor you, and we thank you as we come into alignment with your way for our lives. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. And all God's people say amen. Let us stand all over the building.